Mike could be permitted to speak to this issue. Are you um, part of the presentation? No, but it affects me. I am a depression and suicide survivor of over 50 years. They've never been able to find a medication that works for me. I understand what they say when a program like this will give people a reason to get up in the morning, and I would really highly recommend it. Can I help you for Are you finished? Well, I could say more, but I don't want to take the You're time. okay. Thank you very much. I'm just going to say it was okay with council. You could have five minutes, but if you're finished. Well, it's just that people have a real strange idea of people with mental illness. They, they have the, the television view that somehow somebody's going to take out a knife, take out a gun, or whatever. I graduated from a university. I put a five-year program into three years and graduated with first-class honors while struggling with depression and not even knowing I had it. I since went on to have a fairly successful teaching career until one person found out I had depression and then I was fired. And that affected my family. It affected my career. I remember being pushed so hard by that organization that as I had to go into an EMI, my little boy looked up at me and said, Daddy, are you going to die? The people who suffer with mental illness need our compassion. We really need to educate ourselves because somehow it's assumed that if you suffer with depression or post-traumatic or many of these other illnesses, that you are of no value to society. And you really don't need to be told that because that's how you feel about yourself. And while I went through university, I won scholarships every year. I had tremendous reports from the, the people who came to see me teach as I went towards getting my teaching career. And since then I've run into an awful lot of people and the number one thing is I'm ashamed to let anybody know because they won't look at me the same way anymore. And whatever I have to say and whatever I have to do will not be valued. So I, I just wanted to at a personal note because I think that a program like this is so badly needed and we're so far behind the eight ball. And thank you for giving that time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers this evening. And as I looked into this space, um, one of the things that comes forward is that one of the worst places to have mental illness is in the first world, North America and Europe. If you have mental illness in the third world, they treat it as a community problem, and the community gets around it. What tends to happen in North America is it's treated as a clinical problem with the things that we've heard this evening. So I would like to thank the people that have spoken up here, and um, I look forward to seeing them again tomorrow. Thank you, Councillor Gurman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. I recognize the fact that it is not uh, our policy to move recommendations after presentations. Uh, in particular, we don't move them where there might be a case of something controversial and other members of the public might to, uh, w would like to weigh in. To be honest, I can't see any member of the public who would be opposed to us letting uh, moving a, a letter of recommendation for this type of project. And the issue we face is the next regular council meeting is not scheduled till April 11th. So I was wondering if council would indulge me in moving that we write a letter of recommendation uh, for this project. Second. Council? Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to say that uh, this organization is on our grant night, which is tomorrow as well. So, yeah. <laughs>
Councillor Platt. Yeah, thank you. I absolutely support sending a letter. That, that's the bare minimum we should do. I, so I happily to do it. And I know we're seeing them tomorrow for a grant, but whether or not they get the grant or not, this is an opportunity for us to do something tonight, not just punt it down to the next council meeting. So I applaud Council Dern for bringing it forward, and I wish I had thought of it myself. <laughs> Council? All in favor? Against? Carried. Thank you. Okay, we're not trying to move things ahead too, clean, too quickly, but there are a number of you here who have come to the last item, and you've been sitting a long time, and thank you for your patience, and I'll ask the clerk to introduce you again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This next item is 1550 Carroll Road. It's a rezoning and development permit application. The report of the group planning is recommending the council approve the rezoning from A1 to R A3 and the development permit to be approved for the proposed construction of one three-story and one three to four-story building for affordable seniors housing. Thank you. <coughs> Council, any questions of staff? Councillor Platt. Thank you. Uh, through staff, in the report, it references uh, the way in which a covenant is not being uh, proposed in order to help the organization with a better mortgage rate. That's my understanding. So my question is, is there a precedent of Saanich doing this before this time? Thank you, through Mr. Chair. In terms of a precedent, certainly I would have to look into that. If there hasn't been covenant searches for senior housing, you get that information back to council. But uh, that, that is, I would I would like that information to come forward. I, it's not going to prevent me for tonight from probably making a, a decision, but I would like to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call on the applicant, I just want to. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is to Director of Engineering, please. Um, the, um, there was lots of talk around Arrow Road, which is a residential road, and uh, I know that Saanich has all these guidelines about how we actually establish uh, sidewalks. So can you tell me where Arrow Road would actually be uh, under your evaluation today, where, where it would be five years, ten years for improvements? Yeah, through uh, the chair of Council Brownoff, we did uh, look at the section of Arrow Road for uh, its merits for a new sidewalk, and it certainly has its merits. It is in close proximity of the University uh, Center. It does connect with the seniors' facility um, as well as the surrounding community. Um, however, we're considering the other priorities within the municipality. It's, uh, not in the next five years uh, in terms of the capital plan, but likely between the five to ten year capital plan where this would be identified. Uh, are there any things that we could do, because uh, when I was out there walking it, are there any things that we could do for the asphalt to make it a little safer? Uh, through the chair again, Council Brownoff, uh, there are some interim steps we could do. Uh, it wouldn't be the full uh, expense of a new concrete sidewalk, but uh, we could look at putting um, an extruded asphalt curb to provide a little bit more um, protection for the pedestrians along uh, what is seen as uh, kind of an informal sidewalk that's there today. And that could be done at a, a relatively low cost, but uh, probably still in the ballpark of around $50,000. Thank you. Councillor Murdoch. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is in a similar vein to that of Councillor Brownoff, and I've actually I've walked that section of Arrow a number of times and uh, have actually seen emergency vehicles coming over the hill. Uh, and when you're in that situation and you're standing on the road, you can't help but feel like you're standing on the road because a fire truck is coming at you. Um, so I, I was curious, I noticed the report talks about um, one of the sustainability or so social well-being features being a separated sidewalk. I think that means in front of the building. And so I wonder, often when we see multi-family or multi-unit development, we see a contribution towards sidewalk improvements in the area. And I wondered if that was something that had been discussed with the applicant. Appreciated, of course, that you know the nature of the building is that they're going to want to try and minimize their costs. Thank you, through Mr. Chair. That is, in fact, the, the case on this application. There was a discussion about community contributions related to 
this application and uh, the applicants have advised that this is a, an affordable senior sizing project um, and funds are being directed to make this project feasible and, and further community contributions are not part of the proposal from the applicant. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lee, you curious if this were not, if the nature of this application was not <coughs> affordable housing, senior, seniors housing, what would be sort of the amenity range you'd be looking at in terms of a sidewalk contribution? Could we pull the mic a little closer, please? Yes, uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the range that we've been seeing for market housing is 1500 per unit, um, and that is dedicated towards whatever community many is discussed with the community. If they would like a sidewalk, Funds could be directed towards that, uh, alternatively a playground or the affordable housing fund. So um, the discussion about which amenity, it happens through the, through the rezoning process, but it is around $1,500 per unit. Thank you. Councilor Dunn. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to check, for, check the staff. My understanding is that we were looking for a contribution in the neighborhood of $1,500 a unit for affordable housing, but that, that was not the limitation of amenity that council might expect or ask for. Certainly, there have been some through Mr. Chair. There has been some recent applications where there has been a higher contribution provided than fifteen hundred, but generally the average is fifteen hundred per all amenities that are proposed. If I could, Mr. Chair, uh, in the time I've sat on this council, not just recently, there have been many applications where the amenity package is more than $1,500 per year. Uh, would you have to care to come forward? Uh, sorry. After Councillor Hayes. Um, I'd like to um, extend on that question on timing around priority on our own sidewalk and amenities on that street and the phases of this development. Because I understand that phase two, when I read this, is not due for maybe 10 years. So I'm just wondering, is there a, a convergence of those two events that sidewalks might be there in 10 years as that development is coming online? Councillor Lee. Through the chair. Um, this, uh, as I explained earlier, the, the, the sidewalk um, um, ranking for this particular location would likely be between the five to ten year mark based on concurrent funding levels for new sidewalks. Um, if, uh, if the development proceeded after the ten year mark for the second phase, then yes, it would be uh, very likely that uh, that sidewalk would be in place by then. Um, but that is, um, that is still five years down the road and there's still many things that potentially could happen there in terms of setting priorities and, uh, and funding levels uh, during that time. Thank you. It's always difficult to put sidewalks. Every time we have an application come forward, I believe council would like to put a sidewalk either down the street or in front of a development. But it comes back to budgets and it comes back to priorities. And uh, saying that, would the applicant share with us? Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, happy birthday. <laughs> I believe that's correct, isn't it? Yes. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, my name is Peter Daniel. I'm the asset manager of the Anglican Diocese of British Columbia. Um, the diocese has been along, around uh, over 150 years, and it's called the Diocese of BC because it was on Vancouver Island and it was established before the mainland, so we, we still call ourselves Diocese of BC to some uh, chagrin with uh, other dioceses in the province. We are 45 parishes strong. Um, we have 11, uh, we don't have 11 societies. We put, we put board uh, members on boards of 11 housing societies on Vancouver Island. Uh, we own uh, one company that provides housing and we have one educational societies. Uh, the two largest Housing societies are in Saanich, Mount Douglas Court, and Dawson Heights together have uh, over 230 affordable housing units for seniors. Uh, in in um, um, the case of uh, Mount Douglas, it's been going uh, for over 40 years. 
Uh, some members of our board are here tonight. Um, <clears throat> I want to mention specifically David Cooper, our chairman, uh, Jane Mason, our, our vice chairman, and Stephen Martin, our treasurer. I know other members are here, and I appreciate them being here to support this. Uh, consultants, tonight uh, we have uh, Barry Cosgrave of Number 10 Architecture. He's a principal. Um, and Mark Anthony is the um, uh, lead architect on this project, and Sh Sean Porter uh, is with us tonight as well. Thank you, Sean. Bruce Croshaw from Westbrook uh, Civil Engineers is here, and Rene Lucier from Ladder um, Landscaping is here as well. Um, Gail Karen, our manager, is here tonight, and she will speak to you in a little while. As well, Bill Patterson, Mike Dalton, and Steve Blair of CETA Group are here, and Bill will talk to you briefly about Bill Green. He's a director of Bill Green. My background, I'm uh, 40 years in the development business and have done a number of projects in Saanich. For three years I've been <coughs> asset manager of the diocese and I love what I'm doing. It's very challenging and uh, uh, most people don't know that we even have affordable housing projects. We have some 400 individuals. Uh, housed in, in our society's lands. I'm an Anglican all my life and uh, a prisoner of Christchurch Cathedral in Victoria. Why are we doing this project? We've been here on this property over 40 years. The society has paid off its mortgage and has no debt. The demand is pressing and growing for affordable seniors' housing, and I'll touch on that in my comments. <clears throat> and the society's mandate is to provide affordable housing uh, in the future. <clears throat> I'll make a presentation and I'll try and keep it brief. Thank you. <clears throat> Mark Anthony will make a short presentation on the um, architecture <clears throat> and my landscape architect will do a, a short presentation on the highlights of the landscaping. Um, the consultants are here to assist in answering your questions and questions from the public as they arise. <clears throat> I'm going to address my concerns to some neighborhood concerns that we received in correspondence last week, and boy, we received a lot of correspondence, and so have you. Um, this particular one was from uh, four people who have been really engaged uh, in this uh, as it's proceeded, Charlene Gregg and David Madison from 3995 Belmore Place, Barb Geddes from 1544 Quiver Place, and Morgan Wilson from 4016 Hopesmore Drive. And they have uh, listed a number of concerns, among them procedural fairness, density, height, overshadowing, issues with Arrow Road, parking, and restrictive covenant. So this is about rezoning approval for two phases of development. The first is for an additional 100 new homes <clears throat> on a three-story building to be located at the northern end of the or portion of the property is phase one. This lovely aerial photograph was part of the planning uh, report to you. Our property is outlined in yellow there. Um, north is closest to the bottom of the, of the photograph and that is the area where the new Phase 1 building is planned. To the top of that photograph, Mackenzie Avenue. To the left, as you're looking at Cedar Hill Crossroad, Cedar Hill Road, and beyond it, University uh, Center, a project of mine some years ago. <coughs> the red dotted line is a private easement that connects this property to Belmore uh, Place uh, uh, to the east. The light yellow dotted line is uh, traffic, uh, uh, public right pathways uh, and rights of way from uh, owned by Saanich. <clears throat> the existing building is not being changed or moved, and no existing residents will have their rent changed by this project. That has been a misconception that uh, some residents have had. Neighborhood <coughs> concerns. Procedural fairness, not only have we put together uh, and kept updated a very detailed website, but neighbors have been afforded every opportunity to present their positions and have made numerous submissions. 
We've met with neighbors and residents several occasions. We've met with neighbors uh, individually. Uh, we've met with the um, uh, Gordon Head Residents Association on several occasions. The society has been transparent in its approach, adhering to principles of procedural fairness. The Gordon Head Residents Association's report, well, we first met them in uh, the fall of 2014 uh, at our building with some of our residents. Uh, they provided uh, a report uh, to uh, your planning department, uh, I believe in June of last year. And the first three um, elements of this report, the proponents are to be commended for engaging the Mount Douglas Court residents, adjacent residents, and the board early in the review process. The society and its consultants should continue to engage adjacent residents, particularly concerning building setbacks, fencing, vegetation buffers, to reduce the impact of higher density and site coverage. Upgrades to Arrow Road should be considered to improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists. The existing road and contiguous paved pedestrian path are already deficient for existing traffic volumes. Uh, that um, may or may not be a fact. Um, it uh, doesn't seem to be with the engineering department, but it does with the Gordon Head Residents Association. This morning we received a letter from the Residents Association suggesting that Arrow Road upgrades should be accommodated as part of the signage approvals for this project. And as part of their current position, they're neutral on the project. You must have a copy of this correspondence in your material. So balancing the needs of residents and signage. <clears throat> Neighbors have lived with affordable seniors housing for over 40 years. Seniors are the best kind of neighbors. They're quiet, they're pedestrian, they're non-commuters. 75% of our residents at 1550 Arrow Road are over 65 and two-thirds are single ladies. 94% of those residents live alone. There's a pressing demand for affordable seniors housing and this demand is regional and it's growing. The challenge is in accommodating all of Saanich residents as this pressing demand is met. Residents at 1550 Arrow Road are neighbors too. Some seniors' facts. Seniors uh, over 65 in the Victoria region make up 20.3% of the population where the BC average is 17.5%. That's not surprising to any of us in this room, I'm sure. According to census data, this segment of the population is expected to increase by over 20% in the next five years to 85,000 by 2020. Average median annual income is $29,200 in Victoria. Half of the greater Victoria seniors population have annual incomes of less than $29,200. In BC, that figure is 24,000. Half of the 820,000 seniors over 65 in British Columbia live on $24,000 or less. The average annual income at Mount Douglas Court is $17,000. The economic reality today, we're experiencing the lowest interest rates in 100 years. Part of the reason we can even consider this is those low interest rates. We're living longer. Today, 70, I think, is yesterday's 55. We're working later in life, certainly in the case for me. And saving is difficult and returns are low. <clears throat> Imagine trying to get by, even if you've saved $50,000, where you can't invest it in anything that Im imperils the capital. You're limited to 1% to 2% on that money, and it's just impossible to make ends meet. That's the, that's the trap a lot of these folks find themselves in. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, provides affordabil affordability level data right across the country, and they, they calculate level one, two, and three affordability rents. And in Victoria, for bachelor units, $775 a month is uh, affordable 
uh, in their level one category. $710 a month is an affordable battery unit rent for level three category. Our units at Mount Douglas Court are $450 a month, including heat, water, and cable vision. That's on an average. One bedroom apartments, affordable $900. Level three affordability, $850. Have we got a need? We had 33 applications last year and could only satisfy 10. <clears throat> Dawson Heights presently has 60 applications. Baptist Housing has many applications and wants to send people to us when the building is improved. We have strong support in the region from some neighbors for our project. This is an excerpt of a, a letter we had from a neighbor, which is passionate and compelling. My job is to provide support and assistance for low-income seniors and adults with disabilities living independently in the community. One of the hardest questions I get are those to do with housing and shelter. As an outreach worker, I'm in their homes almost every day. There are so few resources to draw on and waiting lists are so long. Some have been waiting for up to 10 years on the BC housing wait list. Some of my clients have lived for years in motels. Mold and bed bugs are not uncommon, almost all of them have balance, mobility, vision, and or hearing issues that impair their ability to stay independent, yet they persist. Almost none of them own their own homes. In my position, my caseload alone is over 200 individuals. This lady wanted to be here tonight. She's not coming back until tomorrow. I'm sorry she couldn't be here, and so was she. She wanted to speak for this project. Another uh, concern is buildings are too high. Land use is not an issue. None of the neighbors uh, seem to a dispute that seniors' affordable housing is needed and it's acceptable on this site. <coughs> Our initial plans were for a four-story development and they were shown to the Residents Association and Sanitary Planning staff. <coughs> Sanitary Planning staff recommended a limit of three stories in the Phase 1 building. <coughs> the project has to be financially viable. With reduced development, it will not be. Underground parking is just too expensive for us to provide affordable housing. And if we don't do that, we've got no green space. Shadow studies. We had a very concerning email uh, come across uh, a, a day or so ago, and I'm sure you've seen it as well. Um, uh, very upset that we changed uh, part of our shadow studies and took them off our website last December. These are the shadow studies that were on our website and are uh, part of your um, planning report to council. Um, the as you as you go across the page from top left to top right, that summer the middle is um, uh, spring and fall, and on the far right is December 21st. Those shadow studies in December are deceptive, and they're not normally used in in um, uh, looking at a project. Um, that first nine shadow study. Um, picture there is for phase one and the existing. This second bunch is for phase one and phase two. The proposed uh, project shadows are contained within the property ex with the exception of December. All properties cast long shadows in the winter months, um, in, in, especially in the, in the morning and the after, late afternoon. Uh, An existing high vegetation on the east and west prop property line also cast shadows. I'm sorry that the individual who wrote this didn't call me or email me and ask uh, why this was changed, but uh, there's the explanation. Phase development. Uh, phase one is 100 new homes in a three-story building at the north of this four-acre site. Eventually, in 10 to 30 years, the existing building will be at the end of its useful life and need to be replaced. And we've had studies done to confirm that it will be okay to be used for at least another 10 years. The plans are for a replacement building of 140 units and three and partially four floors. In total, the project is proposed to provide 240 affordable senior housing units.
give you an idea what it, it would look like. It's a completed project as designed today. Another uh, concern is the project is too big. The proposed density of the development and build up of 240 homes in two buildings would have a floor space ratio of 0.835. Excuse me, do you yeah. mind going back on the frame and pointing out which buildings are phase one and which are phase two? Sure. The building and the gray roof is phase one. The building with the white roof is phase two. Okay. So the proposed density of the development on our four acre property is 0.835, the lowest of the 12 comparables uh, uh, looked at by the uh, planning department. Density measured by unit count, unit count would not reflect variations resulting from the size of units and generally speaking, market housing would provide larger units than affordable housing developments. That's taken right from the planning report. I think what it says is affordable housing or small units. Our average size unit in the, in the total project we're proposing is under 500 square feet. We can't build bigger units and have them affordable for seniors. Uh, by building those, they're not really much of interest to anybody else. They're specially built units. Market housing, uh, the same square footage of area, would result in a, a lower unit count. Our residents love their green space and landscaping, and this is an important to the society. A two-story development would be at the cost of green space and would not be financially feasible. In other words, if we covered the whole north end of this property with a two-level building, we could not eventually build another building that would even replace the existing